Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to Tuesday Tissue Tips. This episode is number 271, and today we're talking about why reflecting is essential to teaching. Why reflecting is essential to, I would say, healthy teaching, good teaching, insightful, impacting, inspiring teaching. Let me set the scene. This coming Sunday, I'm preaching on John chapter 9, the man born blind in the latest latest uh, sermon in our series, the One Thing series. I'm praying about it this morning, and part of my prayer was to, I was asking God to show me the meaning of John 9 for my own life so that I can live it myself this week before preaching it on Sunday. See, reflecting on a passage is part of preparation, and as a place, which I've talked about elsewhere, to pull apart a text, to analyze it, to exegete it, to research the content, the context, all of that is good stuff. But another essential and, in my experience, neglected aspect of preparation is reflection. Now, in her book, Your MA in Theology by Zoe Bennett, she says this, reflection takes time and demands attention to what is new to us rather than a quick jumping to conclusions or hurrying on so fast we miss things. Uh, She's writing there about writing an MA. I'm talking about writing a lesson or preparing it, but the principles are the same. We can get the information right, but it takes time to figure out what's new to us. You see, you and I may teach some of the same passages again and again, but they should always be new. And the way they become new and fresh is because we reflect on them. Because the last time I taught on uh, the man born blind, and I have taught on it a few times, I was a different person with a different congregation at a different time in life in different circumstances. So when I study it again now, it's important I don't just regurgitate what I already know, but think about what it means to me now. What's new in this now? There's something new every time we preach, even if it's a, a passage we've taught before, there's something new. But to discover that something new takes reflection and that takes time, paying attention. Otherwise, we jump to conclusions and we hurry on and we don't really think about what it means. I wonder if that might have been what was happening when Paul warned Timothy about people teaching false doctrines in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. He says, they, these people teaching false doctrines, they want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. And the word know, they don't know what they're talking about, is, the, is a word that's also translated reflect. We'll see that particular passage uh, shortly. That word no can also be translated reflect. So I wonder whether what Paul is saying to Timothy is they they want to be teachers, they have information, but they don't know, they haven't reflected on it as to what it really means. So they have ideas, but their conclusions are what he calls in verse 6, just meaningless talk. I wonder sadly how many of my lessons, and perhaps yours, have been rather meaningless. Not because they weren't necessarily accurate as such, but they, they didn't have meaning because we hadn't reflected on them. You and I have probably heard um, ourselves teach, if not others, words that we knew were true, but didn't seem to have any impact. And perhaps that's because we weren't reflecting. That same word can also be translated understand, as in Mark 13, verse 14, when Jesus says, Uh, When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, that's the word, which can also be reflect, let the reader reflect, then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So Jesus is urging us to reflect, or perhaps it's uh, it's Mark himself, urging us to reflect on what was being said by Jesus in order to grasp the meaning of his instruction. Reflect on it, think about it, and you'll understand when to flee to the mountains. You'll know when to do that. I wonder also whether those two people on the road to Emmaus, uh, when they talk about how their hearts were burning later in Luke 24, they were putting together their experience and the teaching of Jesus there, reflecting on it. Peter in Acts 11, I think, is reflecting on that combination of the teaching of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit had told him to do, and the experience of seeing the Holy Spirit fall and what happened with Cornelius. He's reflecting on that in Acts 11 as he recounts the experience of the people around him. Uh, that's a reflection going on. He's gaining spiritual insight by reflecting on a combination of teaching, or if you like, what's ha- you know, for us, the text, and experience. Going back to Zoe Bennett again, she adds this. A former colleague of mine, Brother Patrick Moore, used to say, and I love this phrase, teaching is the overflow of contemplation. Isn't that a beautiful expression? Teaching is the overflow of 
of contemplation. And I think that's correct. Certainly we must study a text, but if it hasn't touched us personally, it's simply going to be, when we teach it, a, a transference of information rather than what it could be, a life altering teaching opportunity. What separates so many lessons from dryness, from being dry to being meaningful and having an impact is because they've touched the speaker personally. And I don't just mean they've got a good personal illustration, though that can help, or, or some other insight, but more you can tell, even if they don't tell you how the passage has impacted them, you can tell that it has. And that takes reflection. Teaching is an overflow of contemplation, reflection. What does this mean? Paul said to Timothy, didn't he, in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, he says, reflect on what I am saying. So he's been teaching Timothy, and then he says, reflect on it, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. The Lord will give you insight. So Paul's letters are, are quite short. He can't put in everything for every circumstance about how to apply his teaching, but he gives him enough as long as, for what Timothy will need, for as long as Timothy is willing to reflect on it. And then that allows God, there's a sort of a channel that opens for God to give his insight to Timothy to figure out how this teaching of Paul may apply in this situation or this situation or that situation. You and I teach better when we reflect on what we're teaching. So three quick tips, and then you can tell me what you think. So I'm assuming, first of all, that we've studied the passage. We understand it. We know what's going on. Having done that, three stages. Number one, pray through the passage. Open it up and pray through it. Let God uh, speak to God about it and, and then as he may speak to you uh, through it as well. Secondly, ask God specifically, as I was doing this morning, to reveal to you the way in which a, perhaps a key theme of the text can be lived out by you this week. So you're saying, God, I understand what the passage is about. But what does it mean for me here and now as I live it this week, as I run up to that teaching, preaching opportunity I'm going to have very soon? And then thirdly, pay attention. Pay attention to what God reveals uh, as you uh, put it into practice, whatever it is. Take note of how that affects you, how it affects your life, the people around you, your, your walk with God. How does it affect you? What difference does it make? And then add that subs those subsequent experiences into your lesson as appropriate. Now, sometimes it may be not appropriate to, to add them in. That's okay. You don't have to prove that you've reflected, but nonetheless, your teaching will have greater authority. If it is appropriate to add in what you learned by living it out, then please do so. Uh, put that into your lesson. So three steps. Pray through the passage. Ask God to reveal to you the way in which uh, you can implement, put into practice a, a key theme of the text and live it out that week. Then thirdly, pray that uh, uh, pay attention to what God reveals through that. Uh, take notes and add it to your lesson if it's all appropriate. So what do you think of my thoughts on reflection? How important is it? Is it something you've uh, not done and would like to try doing? Is it something you have done and haven't found it particularly useful in some way? I don't know. Maybe you could let me know. Or have you done it and found it useful? Or have you uh, found a, an approach to reflection before teaching that works for you? I'd love to know your thoughts or your questions uh, on this. So please leave a comment anywhere you hear or see this recording. Leave it publicly uh, so that we can learn from each other because we learn best when we're learning in community. If you've got any question about this or any other parts of the Bible, or any suggestions for future teaching tips, drop me a message. Malcolm at MalcolmCox.org is the email. You can go to my website, MalcolmCox.org, and leave a voicemail if you like, as Kathy did this week. Thanks, Kathy, for your email and for your voicemail message. I really appreciate it all the way from the Philippines. That's tremendous. Uh, if you'd like a copy of my free ebook on spiritual disciplines called How God Grows His People, then sign up for my lovely newsletter at the website. If you know anybody that would benefit from this, please pass the link on, hit the subscribe button and the notification button, and you will be notified when more Tuesday teaching tip goodness comes to light. Until the next time, though, I do hope and pray that you'll find reflection before teaching to be something that enriches your teaching and hopefully those you are privileged to teach. Until the next time, keep calm and carry on teaching. Take care. God bless.